Welcome to this very special interview with the editors-in-chief of the two foremost US cardiothoracic surgery journals. My name's Joel Dunning and we're here at the STS in Phoenix with Alex Patterson and Dr. Wiesel. Thank you very much both of you for coming. Uh, Dr. Wiesel, uh, you're Professor of Cardiac Surgery at the University of Toronto where you've worked since 1979. Uh, you're director of the Toronto General Research Institute with a special interest uh, in cell transplantation, myocardial protection and vascular biology. In 2010, you were awarded uh, only the 11th recipient of the AATS Scientific Achievement Award, which is their highest accolade of that organisation. And you've been editor-in-chief of the Journal of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery since 2014. And Dr. Patterson, You've actually also worked at the University of Toronto uh, from 1978, but you've moved uh, to Washington University in 1991, and then you were made the Joseph C. Bancroft Professor of Surgery at Washington University in St. Louis uh, and Chief of Cardiothoracic Surgery in 1997. You've been President of the ISHLT in uh, 2005 and President of the AATS in 2010. Uh, and you have been awarded the highest scientific achievement of the STS, the Earl Bakken Award in 2014. Uh, and you've taken over the role of Editor-in-Chief uh, uh, last year from Hank Edmonds. Thank you both for coming. Perhaps if I talk to you, Dr. Wiesel, first, the JTCVS uh, is the oldest journal, uh, and uh, it was established, I believe, in 1931. So what would you say are the particular strengths of the JTCVS as a journal? So we're coming up on our 100th anniversary, so it was 1917, and in, in, in 2017 we'll have our 100th uh, anniversary. And I think that's probably one of the strengths of the, uh, of the journal is that we've been in continuous uh, production for the academic uh, programs in thoracic surgery uh, for many, many years, and that's really the, the major goal is to provide academic surgeons with a voice uh, and an opportunity to uh, disseminate their information to other thoracic surgeons around the world. And Dr. Patterson, you've actually been closely associated with the JTCVS as well, and you've been a section editor there for 12 years in the past. What, what do you think the particular strengths of the JTCVS are? I agree completely with Richard. I, the, the, the AATS is the academic organization uh, of cardiothoracic surgery, and I would say globally. It, it, there's What's the percentage of members that are international in the AATS? It's got to be 20%. Or, oh, yeah. It's, yeah, it's a high number. And it's increasing. And, and those, are, those are institutions producing very quality uh, research, oftentimes uh, you know, outstanding science. It, it, I think it perform, provides an ex, excellent venue for the academic programs. And, uh, and with regard to the Annals of Thoracic Surgery, it's the official journal of the STS, and we're at the STS meeting here, and the, and the official journal of the Southern. Uh, and what for you are the particular strengths of the Annals of Thoracic Surgery? Uh, the Annals is a, obviously a younger journal, um, and uh, it does, uh, as you point out, is the, the parent uh, or the journal of both the STS and the Southern, which are different organizations from the AATS, they've got, I wouldn't, in my mind, they've got different goals. And um, so to me, the opportunity for the annals is to try, and what I've tried to do is to better link the annals to the activities of the STS, which include scientific presentation and uh, uh, communication of that information, but also they've made big investments in the database, uh, which is a global resource now. Uh, and so the, I think the database can be better represented in the pages of the annals, as can other issues like policy and advocacy, which is a big uh, commitment of the, AAT, of the STS. And so that, that offers a, an opportunity for maybe an alternate form of scholarship, if you like, but scholarship nonetheless. So. And Dr. Wiesel, what would you say are the particular strengths of the annals of thoracic surgery? So I, I agree with what Alex suggested. It's, it is the organization for all thoracic surgeons, not just the elite academics. And it does, it's intended and does provide uh, information for the practicing uh, cardiothoracic surgeon around the world and provide information which is very important. And I think the database is a critical component of, of what they, they've been able to provide. Uh, and then it's in trying to interpret that data for the practicing surgeon because it's a lot of data. See, I, I, can I just interject, and Richard and, and I have 
as we've talked, <laughs> been friends for decades, and uh, we both are very committed to scholarship. Uh, and uh, you can see that in everything we've done. Uh, and I, uh, my view is that as surgeons, we're all engaged in various forms of scholarship. Used to be that the scholarship was collecting large series or it was uh, you know, doing exciting work in the laboratory. But there's many more forms of scholarship. This issue of policy I mentioned, uh, education. I mean, there's a whole community of educators that are experts in writing scholarly material and education. So that a whole different area that we didn't, it wasn't ever explored before. Absolutely, thank you. And so maybe if we turn to submissions, I'm sure a very large number of our audience today are going to be people looking and thinking about submitting to both your journals. So maybe Dr. Wiesel, what do you look in, look for in a paper? What would you say, you, what catches your eye, let's say? We're, we're trying to publish material which is gonna have a, a significant impact on our specialty. So we want things which are gonna influence practicing surgeons to modify their techniques, to uh, have an alternate approach. So we have to have things that have impact. And there's no question, as we've looked at the statistics that are involved, is that multi-center, long-term studies are what provides impact and will influence surgeons to change what they do. So single-center reviews without comparisons are not gonna do as well as multi-center you know, a longitudinal follow-up uh, in for any of our special any of our subspecialties. So I would encourage the uh, young, particularly young authors, to think carefully about what they're trying to provide and what the question is that they're trying to answer, and see if they can get the information that would really be valuable to do that. And sometimes it's going beyond their own institution. Sometimes it's going to the STS database. Sometimes it's going to other institutions in their area. To, make a, to get the real good information which is gonna allow them to produce a quality paper. And would you echo that? Are you looking for good studies like this? And what about meta-analyses? <laughs> yeah, we talked about that before you came in. We, I, I agree with everything Richard just said. I, the, the, the game has changed in terms of uh, what constitutes a high quality contribution. Uh, that you can see that in the um, uh, program committees accepting papers for the annual meetings, and it's also what uh, what we judged coming in uh, this business of yet another series of a hundred of my last whatever's sleeve sections you mentioned, and that brings us to meta analysis. It's a it seems as though we're overwhelmed with submissions having to do with meta analysis, and I'd say very few of those are meaningful, novel contributions. And that's important. Um, what advice would you say for authors? What are the common mistakes that you see that really are fatal for a paper or perhaps a reasonable paper just fundamentally damaged by, by making mistakes? What are the common mistakes you see? Uh, the, mo the most common is that they haven't clearly identified what their hypothesis is. They, they frequently have, as Alex said, they have a series of 100 patients with a with an operation, and they're looking for the hypothesis. It should be the other way around. They should try to start with the hypothesis first and then look and see how they would answer that from the information that they have. And that's, that's one of the most damaging problems that we run into all the time. Or conclusions not based on the data presented. Uh, um, you know, suppositions, uh, not clear, concise conclusions. And the other, I think many authors uh, have difficulty stating precisely what it is they're trying to accomplish, and that should set the stage for what the methodology was, and that sets the stage for the results the data in the data analysis. Uh, so I, I think there's many areas where things could be tightened. We, we have, I'm sure, the journal is the same. We publish instructions for authors, which are oftentimes ignored. Yeah, the, the simple basics sometimes, I suppose, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So if we talk about different types of, of studies, I mean, what are your views on case reports? I mean, would you encourage people to maybe go for, go for more minor journals, or, or what are your views on case report submissions? 
So we, we publish a few uh, case reports. Uh, the majority get rejected that are submitted. Um, what we're looking for is something that's going to be a message to our readers. So it's not just that they're reporting something that they found that was unusual, rare, or dramatic. That's, that's not enough. They have to have a message. They have to be able to in, use that case to be able to inform the readers about some portion of the practice, a message that comes from it. And that's what's going to sell a case report. And uh, maybe if we move to, to something I see commonly as well, maybe they've submitted to a non-English journal and uh, in, a more, in another country and then they've thought, well, you know, that was well received. Can they send it to you? Uh, well, if it's been published previously in a, uh, uh, another journal, then they should not be sending the same material to, a, to us or to JTCBS. Uh, I think a more common problem is that is uh, and it's a, in many ways, it's a nice problem to have because people from around the world are submitting patients or papers to the to our journals. In fact, the the third most common source of manuscripts to uh, the annals at present is China, and unfortunately, the, the many of those papers are not written in acceptable English, and we certainly don't have the resources to trans to conduct to do that translation. Uh, 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 work for the authors. So uh, not many, but uh, a sizable number of papers are rejected simply because they're not interpretable. It, it, it's difficult for the reviewers to comment sensibly about the information. Yeah, certainly in the European Journal, we, we refer them to the Oxford University Press Language Service, mm -hmm. uh, which they can independently access. What, what would your advice be to someone maybe from Asia or China wanting to submit to your journal? What we tell them is it, it's more than translation because unfortunately the translation, that doesn't work. What they need is a native English speaking expert who's going to consult with them about wording, syntax, and grammar. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a real problem. Um, in China now, they have enough surgeons mm -hmm. who have trained in North America whose English is better than mine, who, who can do a fantastic job on this. And so there are people in, you know, in their country that they can use as resources to be able to do it. Using the translation service, although we have them and we recommend them and we give them all the information about that, if it's a non-expert individual, it may not be sufficient to be able to get a high quality product. It, you know, you have to really understand what the, what the question you're answering is. And, uh, and get that information. I suppose uh, some popularity amongst the Chinese audience is the fact that both of you do now have a, a Chinese language uh, edition. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about uh, those projects. Yeah, so, uh, well, I, I, I can, uh, the Annals China experience is younger than the, uh, the JTCVS uh, China experience. So what we've done in the last uh, couple of years is uh, create a China Annals issue for cardiac surgeons and f a separate one for general thoracic surgeons. Uh, the China Annals editors of whichever flavor pick uh, articles pub previously published in the Annals, recently published in the Annals, and those that they judge to be of impact, they tr have those translated and published in Chinese. But those are papers already published in the Annals. And I have to say that's maybe an okay strategy for it right now, but I don't see that as a good future uh, ongoing strategy. I don't think it's sustainable. So what we've done since, since I came on was to have a little, uh, some additional information. We do obviously the same thing that, that they do. Um, and we've been doing that for many years, but what I asked our 31 associate editors in China was, why did you pick these papers? You know, so they, they, we give them 200 and they end up with a list of 10. And I wanted to know why they chose it. So I got them to write it out to indicate why they selected this, these papers and what this information means for them, for the surgeons in China, why they think that this translation of this STS database paper for the Chinese would be important for the Chinese because there's similarities and differences that they have to deal with. And those, those, uh, Editorials, we now have um, some of them we've published in English in our journal just to give the rest of the world 
information about how, how it translates for them into their, own, into their own world. And I think that's one of the things that probably both of our journals are doing is trying to get the information about the similarities and differences of our, of our programs, of our practice patterns, and see if we can use that information to inform each other about, yeah. about the next, what we're gonna do next because we can learn from each other. And I think some of the young Chinese surgeons are looking for something slightly different because they, they, many of them are, they're fluent English readers and speakers, but what they, what they want to read about are other aspects of cardiothoracic surgery that maybe aren't so commonly published. Th issues of ethics, for example, that's a big deal now in, in China. And, hospital management, policy, education, those sorts of things. So I, I, that's why I say I just don't see this simple translation of previously published papers as a long-lasting, sustainable model. For those who are unsuccessful with their submissions to your journals, I mean, what other options do they have? I understand the JTCVS does have some other options for authors. Right, so we have um, the seminars in, in thoracic and cardiovascular surgery, uh, operative techniques, and the pediatric annals. So we have other, other options. And the way we're working it now is that papers we feel provide important information but maybe not have the kind of impact that would be required in the journal will refer to the seminars. And the way we've arranged that is that all the reviews and uh, discussion with the authors goes through the editorial board of the journal. So we don't have a separate editorial board in the seminars. All that's handled by the same editorial board. And then at the end of that, the final decision is made as which would be the best opportunity. And we try to give the authors a very easy process if they want to transfer the paper to the seminars. They don't have to do anything. All they have to do is say yes, and it's done automatically because it's all part of the Elsevier package that we have. And we try to make it as uh, clean as possible, and therefore 80% of the authors have e accepted that transfer. Uh, possibility. Yeah, so, so perhaps as a last question, maybe to both of you and to Alex first, uh, what is the future of journals? I mean, there's electronic journals, there's biomed journals, there's journals that charge to be published and things, there's going to be blurring of things, there's websites. I mean, where are we going to be in 10 years' time? Well, we're, we're definitely going to be in a different place, that's for sure. And you, you see uh, si already a sizable and steadily increasing presence of both journals, the annals particularly online, uh, and we're, we've just recently begun moving all of the case reports uh, to an online version, which then allows uh, the opportunity for more interaction with the authors, uh, bet between the readers and, and the authors, let's say. So there's lots we could do in that regard. We've, uh, we have a collaborative effort going on in social media with uh, Twitter, the Thoracic Surgery Social Media Network, which is a growing uh, a thing, uh, so that, that's exciting. I, ultimately, I think we'll be online totally or digital, but at the moment the publishers are not there yet either. So maybe it'll be a tipping point sometime soon, but I don't see it happening immediately. Yeah. Great, well, I suppose we'll watch this space. Well, thank you very much, both of you, for coming. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you both. And uh, for myself, Joel Dunning, and everyone at CTS Net, I'd like to say thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very much for Great. coming. Yeah, really interesting.